Welcome to the Scoop World Order. We're working on a Saturday because that's what we love to do. Uh, we're going to lead right into the basketball game at 7, so we figured we'd go an hour early for you guys. Uh, nice practice today at the Woody Hayes. Jim Trestle was in the building. Julian Sane dominated. Uh, Jeremiah Smith, is he the best receiver on the roster, including Emeka? There's some big-time questions to ask, but JJ is lighting guys on fire right now. He is a uh, he is a problem. Uh, even for Denzel Burke, he was torching him. Uh, I mean, he's a... He's a different cat. So we're going to get into all of that uh, today and some other things we heard from practice. Uh, some buzz. Take your questions. Uh, go for about an hour and then go right into the NIT matchup versus Virginia Tech. As always, we appreciate you guys kicking with us uh, on your Saturday. I hope you guys are enjoying March Madness. Again, we know there's a lot going on today, but we bring it every day because that's what we do. Uh, this ain't for everybody, but we roll on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Christmas, Thanksgiving, because we like bringing you guys good information, good content. So we appreciate you guys kicking it with us on your Saturday afternoon. If you guys enjoy this content, please leave us a like, click subscribe, also click that little alert bell. Shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out who you guys are watching with. Shout out, uh, what do you guys want for March Madness? Have you guys been at your house? Uh, do you hit a local bar? Do you hit Buffalo Wild Wings? Do you hit Twin Peaks? Is it uh, one of the, the local places around here? Love to see where you guys like to go and watch uh, Town Hall, Mandrake, uh, there's a lot of places. I, I think every sports bar I drove past in the last, uh, since really Thursday, has been absolutely slammed. So uh, I love that. I, it's great for business for all of the uh, the local places, especially Buffalo Wild Wings, uh, which is one of our sponsors. So I uh, appreciate you guys taking care of the folks uh, and enjoying March Madness. Nevada, the March Madness for us, Julian Sane, Jeremiah Smith, Jeremiah Javier Smith, JJ Smith. Um, you know, they had a practice today, throwing it around a lot. I wouldn't call it a scrimmage. Uh, I don't really know if they do, like, true scrimmages anymore um, in the spring. Uh, it's not like how they used to where they'd move the field. They'll probably do a little bit more of that next week. But a lot of good work in today. Uh, your thoughts on what you heard today. We had a nice report from people that were at practice today. Uh, it's up on BuckeyeScoop.com. It's been up on BuckeyeScoop.com for hours. It's much more in-depth than what we usually give out on a podcast. So uh, if you guys want to know what's going on inside the Woody Hayes during spring ball, Join BuckeyeScoop.com. But Nevada, tell us a little bit about what you heard today. And who are some guys that are new potential stars in the program? Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, it's this time of year when Ohio State's trying to do a lot of different things, trying to, you know, move guys to different spots, seeing what they can have. And, you know, as it was described to me, they're trying to stress guys. They're trying to put them in stressor types of situations, see how they respond. And so, lo and behold, today with the ones, who do they roll out there? They roll out Julian Sane with the ones. You know, the freshman going out there, uh, he's a guy that I, you know, I've been watching for a long time, watch him at the Elite 11, watch him in high school, and he's just a pure quarterback. He's just you know, everything you want in a quarterback. Um, but, you know, he's young. He's inexperienced. He doesn't have 50 starts like Will Howard. He doesn't have multiple years in the uh, – and the system like Devin Brown, but they rolled him out there with the ones to see what he can do. And he balled out, played really well, really looked composed, you know, really looked in command of the offense, has really got already an early connection with J.J. Smith. Those two, um, you know, well, J.J. Smith's kind of got it with anybody and everybody can throw the ball, but Julian and, and J.J. have clearly been working out. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's watching the two of those guys together is, is pretty magical. But Julian, you know, he started you know, the the buzz is starting to build on the guy, and it would not shock me at all to see him be the backup this year. And I know that sounds kind of blasphemous when you've got Will Howard and you and you've got Devin Brown and you know, Lincoln and guys with more experience than than Julian. But I mean, he's he might be the best pure passer on the team. Like they, you just said, you know, if if it was just about throwing the football. He might be the guy that does it the best. And, um, you know, that that kind of gets you, you know, part of the way there. Experience and reading and recognition and running the football. A lot of other things going to play in the quarterback position. But when it comes to just throwing it, he might be the best guy on the roster right now. And I think they like him. I think they clearly want to invest in him. They want to invest in him early. Um, they want to know that they want him to know that Ohio State is you know, a place that they want him to have a future at. You know, with the transfer portal now, you've got to constantly be selling to your players, both on the roster as well as guys on the roster on other teams. But, you know, for a guy like that, you know, when you're in a quarterback room where there's five guys, you know, he's got to see his future. He's got to see that you like him. You can see, what, you know, that you really want to invest in him and see what he can do. 
But Julian's a guy that that could. I mean, he could play this year. And I know that sounds crazy with those two guys, but he's a guy that could see playing time this year. I know it's practice for. I know it's early in the spring. I'm not trying to get over the moon on in terms of doing this, but he's the real deal. Was clearly a guy that everybody was watching today, and everybody that was there said the same thing, which is, "Wow, that that kid is the truth. That kid is the real deal. You can just kind of tell." And um, he's a name to watch out for. So Julian's saying. I know we've talked about him before, but always kind of talked about him in terms of investing in the future, what it's going to look like in 25, 26. I'm just telling the future might be a little quicker than that, and it may be a guy that you want to watch on for uh, what he can do this year in 2024, as crazy as that sounds. Yeah, I think Julian, and I just tossed this film on, is uh, he was described to me by somebody that really, really would know inside the WAC that he's the fastest processor Ryan Day has worked with in terms of processing his reads, processing stuff on the blackboard, taking in the playbook, learning information. He is a football genius, and that's how you get to run with the first team. I don't think I've ever heard of, a, of an early entry freshman running with the first team during spring practice, but... You know, we're, and again, we're not that deep into spring practice. This is like the fifth practice. I mean, they had two before spring break, and this was the the third one this week. Um, they were Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday this week, and I mean, it kind of says it all. I mean, when there's an early entry guy who is playing with the ones that early, it reminds me of um a few years ago, twenty twenty. Uh, there we went to the national championship. Paris Johnson was a true freshman who uh who um was in the mix at right tackle the second he got here which is crazy uh Nick Petit for obviously won that job uh, ended up being a draft pick uh in 2020 but Paris was rolling with the ones uh as a high school senior essentially and that's that's literally insane so you you're, you have to be some sort of a phenom uh to be in that position Julian saying is just that and again you know Ryan Day and Chip Kelly you know, best case scenario is that room stays the same. Uh, worst case scenario is one of the two, likely Devin Brown, transfers. And again, I don't want Devin to transfer. I hope Devin's here and he competes for a year and either becomes the starter or backs up Will Howard. And then next you know, next spring, we're talking about Devin versus Julian Sane and having another heated uh, quarterback battle. But, you know, if you're Ryan, you know, you can't be caught flat-footed. You can't be caught in a utopian society where – well, you know, we'll have all these guys forever and there's no way that any of these quarterbacks could transfer because, you know, Joe Burrow transferred out. It was the best thing for him. Uh, we've had a ton of quarterbacks transfer out over the last, you know, five years. And it's just, it is what it is. You know, I know Devin burnt the boats, but maybe he still has a jet ski. I love, I really love Devin Brown. I think he's got, he's got something to him. Uh, he he wants to win this job. Uh, I think that he's, you know, for now, I, I think he still has an edge on Wahar just because he knows the playbook much better than I'm sure Will Howard does. I'm sure Will's getting there now. Um, He's got five practices under his belt, but Devin had multiple years of practices under his belt. So it's hard to, you can't, you know, uh, get caught up to, to that level of experience um, that quick. But Joy is saying, I mean, you know, they got to give him some reps because you don't want to be in a situation with Lincoln Keenholz last year where he looked lost. And that's something that, um, you know, it, it, not that that bowl game meant anything, but, you know, Lincoln didn't get here till the summer. Julian's already running with the ones in spring football. Um, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see what goes on uh, with Lincoln as well. But again, I hope they all stay. Now, you know, in in utopia, that could happen. In reality, I don't know. But I uh, I love Julian saying. Um, and at the end of the day, there's only one quarterback that really gets to play. So if you put a gun to my head, Julian saying is our franchise and he's a future and what a future we're going to have with this kid because he is an absolute superstar. I thought he's the best quarterback in the country. Thought he was better than Dylan Rayola last year, um, and I think he just has massive upside. He's he reminds me of Aaron Rodgers, and again, that's exactly what I want in a quarterback. Um, just with how he processes stuff, the arm strength, the touch, uh, and again, when wide receivers on the team uh, that we we know really well say that he's the best quarterback on the team, he throws the best ball. Um, that tells me a lot, and, and again. Does that mean that he knows the offense the best? No. Does that mean that he's the best in 11 on 11 situations? No. But if a guy says he throws the best ball and he's only an 18 year old, then that says something about his arm talent, his arm strength, his accuracy, his timing. Because uh, those guys know. I always say, if you guys want to sound really smart around your friends, just say, hey, you know, the players know who the players are. I mean, there, there's times where uh, guys get raw deals by the coaching staff. There's guys that, um, 
maybe needed to play more. And I, I, I can literally visualize the faces of some teammates I had, some kids that were on the team when I coached uh, that I, sh I thought should have played more. One was Corey Lindsley. Uh, he should have played the year before he actually started. Uh, and I was right about that. And we, we played uh, Antonio Underwood over him, which I thought was asinine and crazy. But we did it. Um, so, yeah, but I, I think this kid's huge. J.J. Smith is a kid that I think could hit 1,000 yards this year. And I know that's going to be uh, laughed at and played back in my face if, if something happens. But I honestly don't know how he doesn't start, uh, given his, his size, his talent, his speed, how athletic he already is. Um, and really, like, somebody on the board wrote, you know, if we play 15, 16 games, like, you know, 1,000 yards isn't nearly as hard as it used to be in college back when we played 12, 13 games. Like, because now we get the Big Ten Championship. You know, back back in you know the olden days of the mid-2000s when I played, we played 12 games and one bowl game. So it's 13 games to get to 1,000. Now there's, you know, a Big Ten Championship, multiple rounds of the playoffs potentially. Like, you're playing 15, 16 games. So you basically add, like, another three or four games to the back end of the season where, you know, it's like a thousand yards doesn't seem ne nearly as daunting. Uh, and a kid like this throughout the season is only going to get better and better. Um, and the thing that about JJ is he's, he's exceptionally mature. He's very physical. He takes care of his body. Uh, he's got a routine. You know, he's a track guy, so he knows how to take care of his hamstrings. Um, and I think when you have a long, uh, a long campaign, uh, I think taking care of yourself is critical. It's something that nobody ever talks about. Uh, just because they think that you know these kids are just robots and they just go out there and they always feel good, but you got to figure out ways to get out there and play at a high level on days when you don't feel good. And I think JJ uh, is is an exceptionally tough kid. He's been around. Uh, he plays seven on seven, which I think seven on seven for guys like Ennis and Tate is one of the most beneficial. And even Julian saying he was a really good seven on seven quarterback. It's really good for your timing, your route running, uh, and and also it just uh, it accelerates your development. Uh, from a prep standpoint, because these guys are playing major football games year round. It's not just August to November, and then you put the pads away and go do a play basketball on track or whatever else. Like these guys are playing serious football on the weekends in that seven on seven round. Now, is it the same as real football? No, but I think that the amount of skill and the talent and you know JJ is already going to be a marked man. JJ is going to have essentially not a bounty, but I mean every cornerback in the country is going to when they see that guy out there and say oh, that's the number one player in the country and. Yeah, so they're, they're going to want a piece of JJ. and But Jay-Z's already dealt with that the last two years on the seven-on-seven -seven circuit where every corner that squared up on him wanted to make their name by locking down J.J. Smith. And J.J. hasn't let it happen because J.J. is more competitive than they are. So uh, I'm really excited about J.J. Uh, Nevada, your thoughts on J.J. Smith? Uh, I think he could start week one. I really do. Well, I've been saying that for a while just because the position that he plays, you know, and and, you know, I, I think JJ brings special attributes to the field and given the reality of three and out and where, you know, it's going to be. And, you know, we, we look back on how little Marvin Harrison really played his, his freshman year. Now there are some really good guys in front of him, but if, 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 if anything that they don't want to emulate, it's that they underutilize guys during their career at Ohio state and the time went by so quickly and they didn't get enough out of them. And it, when a guy, a guy like JJ Smith, only comes around. I know we've had great wide receivers. I know we get five stars. I know the room's crowded, but the guys like JJ Smith are rare. They, they only come around every 20, 25 years. And when they do, you want to fully utilize them. You don't want to be, Hey, we got 20 good games out of them. You want to be like, look, we played them from the day that you set foot on campus. You like, like, like Orlando pace, Orlando pace could step in in August, start the first game, you know, you go all the way through and then go become the first pick in the draft. That's the way it is with J.J. Smith. J.J. Smith's got to play from day one. I don't think they, there's there's nothing about seniority or any of that stuff that all goes out the window when you have a player like this. And look, you know, he, he, he's he's worthy of the hype. He's And the players know. You, you've talked about the players know who the players are. The, the players know when you deserve it. And you get what you deserve at Ohio State. And J.J. Smith's already got – I mean, they know. When you talk to the guys, you talk to the defensive guys, you talk to the offensive guys, they know. They 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 want to, like, believe me, bagging on the incoming five-star highly heralded freshman would be the first thing they want to do. That That's like a layup for these guys. That's like, oh, yeah, Nevada, this guy, yeah, he's overhyped. Uh, he's, he's good, but he's not that good. Bob. They don't do that with J.J. They're like, no, oh, no, no, that, that, he's the truth. That, that, that kid's really good. Yeah, he's uh, 
he's different. He, he's amazing. So when you hear that, it just it, it makes you know that all the stuff that we've been hearing, everything that we've been seeing with our eyes, everything that we've been kind of prognosticating is spot on. Um, he's got to play. He's got to play early, and I would expect it to be the, uh, the opening snap of the season. Yeah, I think he's going to be nasty. I mean, even when I talk to guys like Edison and Tate, like they say, they say JJ is different. I talk to the guys that the SFE guys, and you know they're just they're, he's different. You know, Brandon is a really tough kid. Cardell's like more quiet kid, smooth kid. But I'm telling you, like JJ is just, uh, he's just a different level right now. I got a super chat. Uh, that any of these other running back front? I'm not sure if that is directed towards our uh, our coaching search that has been uh, ongoing and somewhat of a disaster. Um, which again, I don't, I honestly, I couldn't care less about the running back coach at this point. Um, I would just literally go out and hire the best recruiter in the country and put him at the running back spot. Um, you know, the Sam Drayton thing looks like it's not going to happen just because of the, uh, the money situation. Um, Nevada, do you have any updates on, uh, on the running back coach, uh, search? Cause there's, there's some other names out there, but you know, a, a lot of these guys, they don't want to go through spring ball in the middle of spring ball. Because it is it is a difficult task to try to coach guys when you don't know the players, you don't know the offense. Uh, you're going to kind of like a little foolish. But if you pay them enough, they don't really care. Uh, but your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm I'm uh, one of our rare areas of disagreement. I wouldn't even categorize this as being close to a disaster. I think that you know there, there's so many guys that can be effective running backs coaches at Ohio State. Um, you know they you know. The guy, Markel Blackwell, the guy that coached Quinshawn two years ago at Ole Miss, went to Texas A&M, and I think he's at South Carolina now. That's a name that I keep hearing. I've, I've heard that consistently through the uh, through the agent ranks. A guy that's got experience recruiting the Deep South. Like, they, they want a, a guy that's got experience recruiting Texas and recruiting the South in Florida. That's what they want. Because why is that? Because that's where the running backs come from. If, if, you know, if, if a guy's from Ohio, they know they can get him anyway. But other than that, they're going to come from the South. They're going to come from Texas. So they want somebody with experience on that. I think Blackwell's a guy. I, 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 again, anybody that we get who's not completely lazy is going to be better than Alford. And I think any of the guys, you know, that we're hearing will be an upgrade. I, I, I'm just not. I'm not worried about it. I don't lose one bit of sleep about it. Frankly, I'm not. I'm not all that excited about it. Even when we name them, you know, you're not going to hear a wild rejoicing from me because I just think that position is such a. Uh, I, I, I won't say irrelevant, but it's just kind of, it's a guy. It's you, you want a guy that's a decent recruiter, a guy that can fill it. You just don't want an empty suit. You just don't want a guy that's, in there that's a nothing. And frankly, that's what we've had. So anybody that we get is going to be additive. And uh, so that, that's where I'm at with it. But I think black, I, I think black will makes a lot of sense just because, you know, relationship with Quinshawn, um, great Southern recruiter. They also had the guy from uh, Missouri, the running backs coach from Missouri as well. Um, I mean, they'll get somebody. It, it'll come up here soon, but Ryan doesn't seem to be in a, in, in a particular hurry right now just because I think he likes him and Chip having run on, on the running backs. I think he likes having something to do with those guys because, you know, Ryan's really stepped back. He, he stepped back from the offensive coordinator role and he's more administrative right now. And I, I think you know, part of him wants to kind of keep a connection with the team. And this running back thing has enabled him to kind of do that. And I think he kind of likes that. So I, I don't know if he's in a hurry to fill that spot. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think it's just, you know, I don't think he wants to move fast. I think he wants to move correctly. And, uh, you know, he, he wants to find a guy that's going to be a good fit in the program. Yeah. You know, they've had a lot of, a little bit more turnover than they probably expected with, you know, with Chip Kelly coming on the Bill O'Brien thing, uh, now the Tony Alford thing. And, and again, it's, this isn't a position of super high need. Like this isn't like an offensive line coach or a coordinator um, where, you know, if you, like, if you don't have your offensive line coach right now, it's, a, it's an utter disaster. You know, you'd have the GA coaching it and you really, you really need two guys coaching the offensive line. You usually need your O-line coach and your GA. Um, but running back, I think you just got to do what you got to do. Um, but I think we'll have a, we'll have, um, you know, we'll, we'll end up with someone good. Yeah, and again, like I, I don't lose uh, sleep about a running backs coach because if they're any good, they'll get promoted to coordinator at some point. And you know, I mean, Tony never got promoted to coordinator or hired as a coordinator anywhere, so it kind of says it all to me that he never got promoted to be a coordinator. I mean, they they get the little associate head coaching title, but that doesn't really do much uh, for your for your career. 
Uh, Quinnell Red Tail, thanks for the 10. Massive news, but not mentioned yet. We have two Buckeyes wrestling for a national championship today at 7. Jesse Mendez and Rocco Walsh, both young guys, and we had a fifth place at 285. Congrats to those guys. Uh, Buckeye wrestling is actually really, really fun to go to. I actually, uh, Johnny Buckeye, who is on our site, uh, took me to the Ohio State Cornell match, and it was awesome. I mean, if you guys haven't been to the Cavelli Center, it is incredible. It's a great venue for wrestling. It's it's a smaller arena. It's kind of perfect. And it literally came down to the heavyweight or 285. Um, got up, you know, got the points to win at the very end of the meet. And it was the place like about fell down. It was so uh it was so lit. So I loved it. I thought it was um I think it's one of those underrated hidden gems that uh I think most people don't really know uh much about our wrestling program, but the, the arena was packed. I mean, the hardcore wrestling fans filled that place up and uh, it was fun. Like I, I, I mean, it was the crowd was nuts the whole night. The atmosphere was great. Uh, Nevada, I know you're you're a wrestling supporter. Um, but your thoughts? I got a couple guys going for the the natty at seven o'clock. Yeah, look, I I know people here like to talk about Buckeye football, and whenever we deviate from Buckeye football, I I, I know people kind of gloss out, but Ohio State wrestling's fun, man. Ohio State wrestling is fun. Uh, going to event is great. If you're looking for something to do you know, during the wrestling season, like you said, the Cavelli Center is an unbelievable place, unbelievable venue. Uh, the, the, it's like a rock concert and, and uh, just great theatrics. Uh, so much fun to watch those guys. And uh, Rocco Welch, that, I, I, man, I called him early. I was like, that, that guy just has the look. He just looked like a bad man. I mean, Mendez is just a stud. But Rocco, you know, kind of shocking his way. He's in the final, going to be a big underdog. But, you know, the way he's been surprising people all year long, you know, maybe we get a couple of NCAA champions. You know, you, you never know. It's, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. But if you, if you get a chance to watch, I mean, I got, got a confession to make. March Madness doesn't do it for me. I, I, I want to love it. I, huh. you know, I love the fact that it's, you know, the people go out and go to Buffalo Wild Wings and eat a smash burger and do stuff and make brackets and stuff. But I just, the games, I, I, I you know, to me, I'd be much more into watching, uh, Ohio State wrestling tonight to try to watch them do that. Ohio State basketball and the NIT to see what they can do with that. Um, OSU women's hockey tomorrow playing for the national championship against Wisconsin. But March Madness just, it it hasn't done it for me yet. And I I don't know. I might be the only person in America that hasn't connected with this, but um, it's just the games. I just, I just think they're kind of boring, but that's just me. And I know that might be sacrilege, but that's where I'm at. I don't think it's sacrilege. When people don't relate to the players and, when Ohio State's not in it, I think it just kills everything for us. Um, so yeah, that's I, I think I don't think you're alone in that that the uh, the product isn't nearly as compelling. I, mean, I think I, I know the women's tournament won't get more ratings, but I think the women's tournament might have more star power just because of the one the one girl from Iowa. And uh, but I, I could be wrong. But I mean, like men's basketball used to be incredible, and it's just not what it used to be. Uh, Yard Varks, uh, Lawn Care, thank you for the five. See you studs at beat ups April thirteenth. Uh, What's the address? Keep up the great work. Uh, never miss an episode. Nevada OH. I O. Uh, the address is, let me actually, I can flip this over. I'll throw it on the screen for you guys. So if you guys want to screenshot it, it's real easy to get to. It's um, literally the corner of Lane and High Street. Uh, so it's, it's right by Little Bar. The address is 2151 North High Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43201. Uh, but if you if I pull this out, you can literally see the horseshoe is uh, is very 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 close. It's right here, so you can see it's a very short walk to the horseshoe. Let me actually uh, I'll take your thing off the screen real quick. So the horseshoe is literally right uh, right there. So there's the horseshoe. There's beat ups. Here's Lane Avenue. Right over here is like Heine Gate and all that all that madness. So just uh, here's like right here is like the Varsity Club. Just so you guys uh, kind of have, like, this is about as short a walk as you could ever get uh, to the spring game. So that was my design because we want a big turnout, and we know a lot of you guys are going to go to the game. First time to see Caleb Downs, Will Howard, Quinchon Judkins, J.J. Smith uh, in the horseshoe, uh, in uniform. I think it's going to be awesome. And, again, I think this event's going to blow the doors off of beat ups. I'm really excited about it. So appreciate you, my man. I appreciate you never missing an episode. Uh, Poobier12, thank you uh, for being an ultra member. Thank you for the 10 what are your favorite plays from games you attended as a fan of the shoot? That's a great question. 
My top three in no order uh, season tickets since 2011. Braxton to Devin versus Wisconsin was incredible because they literally did everything wrong on the play. Like Devin ran the wrong route. Braxton had no idea what he was doing. And it, it was like street football. And he just chucked it up there and Devin caught it and we won the game. And us as coaches looked like geniuses, even though they got missed assignments and got graded down on the play. It won us uh, the Wisconsin game. Uh, Curtis overtime touchdown versus uh, Scum. Yeah, Curtis Samuel. That was unbelievable. Olave's blocked punt. Uh, for a touchdown in 2018, it was nuts. Yeah, that was uh, that was a big one. I um, here's uh, you know Nevada. I'm gonna go first, and then I'll let you go. But you know, um, Malik Hooker's uh, pick six kind of changed that that uh that 16 game that was really tight. Uh, we were not doing too hot, and I remember I think Jerome Baker blitzed, and he matched the hand of uh. Of if it was Mac, I don't know who the quarterback was, but he matched the hand to the or Wilton Spate, I think it was, and uh, that ball went flying up there. And Malik just had one of those magical years where he was like magnetic to the ball, and he got there and took it to the crib. That was huge. Um, watching the 17 Penn State game with Nevada, uh, JT Barrett having just like the greatest comeback in probably in the history of the horseshoe versus a really good team. Uh, the plays coming down the stretch of that were incredible. Um, I'm just thinking from games that I actually watched uh, that I attended as a fan. Oh, God, what other ones were there? Um, you know, I, I mean, the Paris, Paris, you know, Paris Campbell against Michigan, uh, Haskins' this year in 18 when he was just torching guys. Uh, I think it was a, I don't know if it was a touch pass or reverse or something coming across the field or if it was a, a drag. It was something that came across the field, then he turned the Jets on and just scorched everybody. That was fun. Uh, that's three, and I'm sure that there's some better ones, um, that I can't think of. Uh, Nevada, uh, what are a few of your favorite plays? You've been to a lot more games of the horseshoe than I have as a fan. Um, what are some of your uh, your favorite that you've seen in person? Man, I I would have to go with. You know, it is funny because the defensive plays generally are the ones that you remember the most. Um, you know, uh, Chris Gamble interception against Penn State where he took that one in for the touchdown, you know, that, that has got to go up there for might've been the loudest moment in the stadium uh, on that pick six. And I, I think it was a 14 to seven game in that magical season when, when Chris Campbell was making all the plays uh, the, the AJ Hawk interception against Texas, when he intercepted Vince young, I thought the place was going to come unglued at, at uh, there. I don't know. I don't know if you remember that, Kirk, but we lost that game against Texas in 05. I'm not sure if you remember that or not, but we did. Yeah, we lost. <laughs> and um, the uh, the uh, uh, man the inter- the interception at the end of the O2 Michigan <laughs> game because on that last play, I think I, I've told the story before, but it, it bears retelling. I had placed a huge bet on Ohio State minus four and a half against Michigan, and so. They're up five, and I don't know if you guys remember the end of that game, but they, they go down and they go down and they 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 throw and then they throw and then so and then they they throw and they they put one second back on the clock, and they're at the like the twenty five, and I I literally turn to my wife and I'm like, they're gonna throw a touchdown and the, and, and and they're gonna beat us and I'm gonna lose my bet because God doesn't want me to be this happy. And she's like, she's like, no, just have faith, have faith. And then he throws the path, and Will Allen steps in front of him and makes the interception. And uh, that, that, that for me might be like the defining moment of my Ohio State fandom was that moment right there because it was a combination of a gigantic, I, I bet so big that I moved the line at the MGM, and and secondly, the one that we had officially beat, you know killed the Michigan curse and we're on to the national champion, went on to beat. Uh, that mighty Miami team in the national championship. But the, I, I'd say the Will Allen interception at the end of the Michigan game might have uh, might have been it for me. I think, uh, yeah, you know, honestly, now that I think of it, like when I was getting recruited, I was in the front row of that game and jumped right over the rail and got on the field. So I, that probably had to have been it just because, but, but at the time it was different because like I, you know, Ohio State hadn't offered me. So I wasn't, you know, I was excited for him, but like I didn't know if I was even going to get to go there because they didn't offer me a scholarship. So, but I was there. 
Um, and it, obviously it was one of those incredible moments uh, in the stadium where, you know, we had played for a national championship a long time. Uh, we still kind of had that boogeyman feel with Michigan. It was a tight game. Um, classic trust, trussle ball, <laughs> you know, and we, we won uh gamble, gamble running back that pick versus Penn state was another one too, where the house about fell down. Um, the stadium just felt like it was louder back then. I don't know why. Uh, I think you know, now we have fewer people in the stadium because we put those suites in, in the end zone, but it was, those were two really loud moments, but I, um, yeah, that was something else that was amazing. And I loved, uh, I loved those wins and coming down the stretch and, now, you, know, now got, you remember at, at the end, you were on the field, but I remember at the end of the O2 game, I remember sitting in the stands because none of us wanted to leave the stadium. Like, like first of all, you couldn't leave because there's so many people. But secondly, I just wanted to stay there and just soak in every moment. And this is when the fans stormed the field and they tried to, they, they tried to tear down the goalposts and there was people hanging on the goalposts. So they started hitting them with the pepper spray and they started falling off kind of like, like roaches falling off of like a thing when you hit them with like the bug spray and stuff like that. You weren't, you didn't get pepper sprayed that day. Did you? No, thank God. I didn't get tased either. I know that's going to be your next question. I did not get tased either. When I was an 18 year old no. kid, I was honestly like, I didn't, I didn't like the feeling of, of being down on the field. Cause it was like, like, I, I'm not like claustrophobic, but I mean, there's like, like I'm surprised more people like get trampled when something like that happens because there's literally like probably you know fifty thousand people like shoulder to shoulder you know and the players are you know crowd surfing and so I mean it's it, you know I was like get me the get me out of here man I was like I don't want to be on this I want to get out of here it's like it's it's cool like you did it you can say oh yeah I stormed the field after the Michigan game but I was like man I'm trying to get out of this thing man this is nuts um but it was cool like like I said I mean there's there's nothing that like matches knowing. Cause that's the thing is like, you can't, you don't get that feeling anymore from a Michigan game because that game literally meant you're going to the national championship. Like that was it. There wasn't like, Oh, we got to go play Oregon next week in the, in the, in the, uh, in the big 10 title. And then we got to go you know, playoffs and all this. Like that literally was like, you punch the ticket and we're out. We're going to Arizona. People are spending their life savings to go to that uh, game against Miami. And for the people who went, it was awesome. You know, it was like, it so it was worth it. But you don't, you can't get that feeling anymore from a home game, uh, a home regular season game, which, you know, it's, it's different. I mean, I don't know if it's better or worse, but it's just a fact that uh, you don't get to punch the ticket versus Michigan anymore like we used to, which, again, it's fine. Uh, I'll be OHIO. Uh, thanks for being a scoop off from for the 10. I have been curious as to what's in the Buffalo Wild Wings cup Burke is always sipping on. Well, it's my favorite water. It's this Kirkland water. It's this uh, this alkaline water, and I buy like seven cases of it every time I go to Costco. And then I've got my my beat ups cups. I've got multiple. I have stacks of these beat ups cups, like literally, literally stacks. Shout out to my boy Mitchell Groob. Shout out to Mike Paul, my beat ups guys. But I've got the big dog here, but I don't have to pee too many times. And I've got the little dogs here. I like the black cup because it matches my clothing since I dress like the Undertaker every day. So, yeah, it's, it's usually without water. I've got a fridge full of them. So if you guys ever see me hunching back over here, it's usually because I'm up in the fridge and getting another bottle of it. So there you go. But I talk a lot. I get parched. Uh, a lot of times I finish working out, hit a quick shower, and then I come in here and podcast for an hour and a half or so. So uh, I'm usually dehydrated. So I'm trying to stay upright for y'all. Uh, CW, uh, the second, thank you for being an ultra member. Thank you for the deuce as well. What's your ETA on the scoop gear shipping? I do not know. I do not touch that. Um, I imagine, uh, you guys will have it within two to three weeks. I'm trying to get it obviously for the, the, the get together. They have to order you know, the, the shop closed yesterday. Our, our biggest drop by far. And we did merchandise drops in the past. And frankly, this was bigger than all of our drops combined. Uh, so thank you guys. And again, a lot of it's because of the growth of the podcast uh, and also the people on BuckeyeScoop.com. The gear is really high quality. They got to order the blanks. They got to print them. They got to ship them. So uh, I will let you, I'll give you guys updates uh, when the stuff starts to ship. Um, but they're going to order the blanks on Monday. Uh, and it'll be really good stuff. Like I said, it's Nike blanks. So it's a high quality shirt. Uh, and it looks really fresh. I'm super excited. I ordered a bunch of stuff myself. So uh, I'll get to be uh, wearing it uh, just like all of you. So I appreciate you guys. It was a huge merchandise drop. Um, Nevada, as we get into these last couple of weeks of spring, you know, they're going to switch up a uh, a little bit. Um, I think that they're going to move to Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which is interesting with Ryan um, not going on Saturdays, which is, you know, it's, it's kind of a, 
I think it's a quality of life improvement. You know, Ryan's he's really improved the quality of life of these of these guys of these coaches, especially because they they practice in the morning, which is great because you get everything done early in the morning. And uh, I I feel like you know you can watch the practice right afterwards, and then you can script everything the next day. Like there's been some real nice quality of life improvements by Ryan. And then if you do the weekend uh, off, which is you know you go Monday, Wednesday, Friday weekend off, I think that that's a huge benefit for the coaches as well. They get a little more time with the family as opposed to practicing Tuesday, Thursday, and then Saturday being a big scrimmage day. Um, but I think that the negative to that is that I don't know how that affects recruiting um, if they do uh, stick to that and, and they do the Saturdays off. Because a lot of these kids, obviously, they have school uh, or they have to travel in from out of state. So uh, there's a lot. You know, there are kids in from Georgia today uh, at practice. There's kids from all over that can make it up here, uh, can fly into uh, – can fly into, um, you know, Columbus you know, on Friday night and go to practice Saturday and get a good visit in. I mean, Tyler Atkinson was here last week, and that's exactly what he did. They flew in Friday after school, spent the day with Ryan and James Lornitis, and uh, got the whole dog and pony show and had a great time. And you know, if we get that kid, I, mean, he's, I think he's the best defensive player in the country for his class. He's, uh, he's the same age as Chris Henry, so he's a 2026, 20, but he's a superstar. He loved it up here. Um, I still think he's a long shot, but if we get him, wow, what a good player he is. Uh, is there any advantage about it to, to changing the practice days from Tuesday, Thursday, uh, Saturday to Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's funny because, you know, it, it, it's definitely a quality of life issue for, for the coaching staff. And I think they're trying to get them a little bit more life balance, but the recruiting stuff is kind of curious because, you know, those weekends are generally when you're trying to get those guys in those big recruiting weekends. Um, but it, it'll be interesting. You know, I mean, I think chip, you know, chip Kelly and, and Ryan are trying to find a little bit more life balance with everybody. They're trying not to burn everybody out They're You know, they, this is something that they've talked about doing for a while. It'll be interesting to see if they stick with it or not, but you know, Look, recruiting has changed. The recruiting calendar has changed. I mean, everything in college football has changed. So I think you've got to be ready to kind of embrace change you know, as we're kind of going forward. I mean, I, I, I look at it like with these kids that are coming in, I find myself you – know, I used to be riveted whenever, you know, as, even before I even got into the business, before every time that they were having a, a recruiting weekend, you know, a big commitment, a guy in advance. And, you know, now I, I – I won't say that I'm, I'm less excited about kids getting, but like, it's just hard to get excited about kids that are two years out because you just never know. Are, are they going to stick? Is it going to change? Is, you know, with, uh, with NIL, is somebody else going to make a, a, a better offer? Then they're going to kind of move on down the road. And, uh, you know, I, I find that I, I think my fandom is kind of evolving. And I think for, for Ryan Day and the staff, I think they're kind of evolving too. how they, they're going to try to deal with, the changing environment in college football, the expanded playoff, uh, the the expansion of adding USC and UCLA and Oregon and Washington, the Big Ten. I mean, so many changes kind of going all at once. So, you know, I think we've all got to be ready to kind of change how we do it. So, I like I, I actually like it. I actually I like the way that they're doing it. I like the way that they're trying to keep the weekends open. And um, you know, it, I, I could reserve to change my mind if I talk to people and they and they hate it. But I know the players are excited about it too, so I mean, so much the better. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think if he could free up those weekends, it makes your life a lot easier as a coach. Uh, Tress was in the building today. That was a big, uh, a big story. Um, God, I, I, you know, I wonder how many of these guys even know who Tress is or know. I mean, you know, they're in their infancy in 2011. I mean, we're up to 2024. They were, you know, four or five years old when Tress was was coaching at Ohio State. But you know, he was in, and he. Uh, he was working a little bit. I mean, he had a practice script, so he was analyzing what was going on. He wasn't just there to be a bystander and hang out and do nothing. But uh, what do you make of this, Nevada? I, again, I think it's it's kind of a curious coincidence that all of a sudden, uh, you know, we get a new athletic director, trusts at practice. And I honestly don't know if he ever came down and observed one of Urban's practices. I don't know. And I don't know if I've seen him observe one of Ryan Day's uh, practices. And again, I, I could have missed it. And if I, if I missed it, I apologize. But... He was down there, and again, there's been a lot made about how Ryan Day got a phone call from Jim Trussell, and Jim Trussell said, hey, uh, you know, this is how I used to split up my special teams between my linebackers coach, my safeties coach, my receiver coach, my tight ends coach, um, which is exactly what I said he should have been doing the whole time. Again, when you add a 10th uh, coach to the uh, 
to the countable coaches. They they always had nine countable coaches, and they went to ten a couple years ago. That doesn't mean make a special teams coordinator. It basically means make your defensive coordinator a walk around position and don't let him coach a position. You know, and that's what they ended up doing. So um, I was excited to see Trust there again. I think he's he's exceptionally wise. I think that our special teams have just been exceptionally poor over the last few years, um, which is amazing considering we had a dedicated special teams coordinator and our, and our, our special teams have just been awful. Um, so trust who is the special teams God in the building, uh, doesn't do anything except for help, uh, you know, help Ryan. And I'm sure James was happy to see him and Heartland was happy to see him. And the guys that, you know, around the building, there's not many left that actually know him, Doug Calland. Uh, but your thoughts on trust, uh, attending practice and, and working through practice. Cause he wasn't there just, just there to, 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 to kick it. And you know, like, like Coop goes to every practice, but I don't know how much, he's like, you know, trying to help Ryan as much as just you know, observe things. And I don't know if he still does his advisory stuff with the Cincinnati Bengals like he had, but uh, it's interesting, you know, Trust came up and talked to the team, which is great, but your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'd been told that Trussell was was there to do business and and I wasn't exactly you know, sure, you know, you know, what what that would entail. And I want to dig into that, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, he had a practice script. He was out there for a reason and it sure had, the, it had a business feel to it. And, you know, they've talked about getting him more involved. And I mean, what a resource to have a guy that's done as much as he have, not only as a, as you know, football, as motivation, as just general administration, as, as, as life management. Um, I mean, Jim Trestle's as, as good as they come. So I like the idea of, of having him involved in some way, shape or form, some sort of capacity. But I, I, but I told there is some sort of relationship, but I don't know exactly what that is, but I need to dig into that. But, you you just glossed on the special teams. Could you go into that just a little bit more in terms of which guys coach which special teams and and why? Because when you say it, it I think it's second nature to you and it's so logical in terms of why you do it. But I don't think a lot of people really know it or quite understand wh- why guys coach certain special teams and why other guys don't. Because I'll hear some other people talk about, oh, this guy should coach the kick block team, and you're like. He would never coach the kickbox team. That's not no. what they do. But could you uh, could you kind of break that down for us? Well, I I know that he uh, he broke down who was doing what, and I can't remember it off the top of my head. But I know James, your linebackers coach has to coach punt because most of the guys that are on the on the punt team, the punt team is the most important. Uh, it's the most important playing football. Jim Trussell's little thing. Um, but but in reality, you know, uh, in all seriousness, like y- you want guys to coach the guys that they coach, you know? So it's like, I mean, for the, so for the field goal block unit, which is comprised of 98% offensive linemen, that's Justin Fry's unit for the field goal rush unit, which is the field goal block team. That's Larry Johnson's unit. So it's, that's, you know, six, you know, D linemen, a couple linebackers, and then you get your corners coming off the edge screaming punt. Uh, that's, James Laurinaitis, because you have a lot of linebackers on there, uh, maybe a couple tight ends, maybe a couple safeties, maybe a couple bigger body types. Um, James was excellent uh, at punt uh, as as a as a player, so he's got a lot of. And I'm I'm sure at some point in the NFL when he was a rookie, he might have worked worked some punt stuff. I know when he's a starting linebacker, he's probably not covering punts when he's a starter, but um, that's natural. Um, kickoff return, you know, you got to have your. Um, have Brian Hartline on that, uh, maybe get some help from, uh, from Tim Walton, Matt Giriani, because you're going to have a lot of, again, you're going to have your, your, your speed guys back returning, but then the guys that are setting, you know, the one and two man wedges in the back, uh, that's going to be your linebackers. That's going to be your, uh, your safeties, like those those types of guys, you you have a bunch of like safety ish linebackers type guys up front, maybe a little bit bigger guys in the middle. I'm on that second wall. Um, kickoff, obviously it's, it's a lot of the, the kind of the, 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 the mid size guys, the safeties, the linebackers, maybe some corners as like, say, as, as a quote, like safety guys, you, you always see a couple guys that kind of lag back on kickoff just to make sure if someone cuts it loose, they're there to prevent it from going to the house. Uh, so you put a couple of your faster guys back on that, but, um, you know, he split it up how I thought he would between, uh, various roles, you know, Keenan Bailey, James Laurinaitis. The guy, the guys that are, are coaching the positions and have lighter positions to coach are going to be coaching. You know, Matt Giriani's got a really deep special teams background. 
uh, Tim Walton can help because a lot of his corners, especially like his younger corners that are trying to make a mark in the program, they can help out on special teams. So that's kind of how you split it up. That's why I always thought it was idiotic to have a special teams coordinator instead of a linebackers coach because, you know, your special teams coordinator doesn't have any cash on the road in recruiting. And special teams in modern college football has never been more. And again, I don't want to say this because I, I just said that, you know, our special teams stunk. But it's cost us games, like huge games, the Michigan game, the Georgia game, um, where our guys didn't execute because for whatever reason, and again, you have to remember this, Bill Parcells had one of the greatest things ever. It's like, if the player doesn't get it, it's on the coach. It's not on the player. So, and a lot of coaches want to avoid the, the the task that is coaching. But when you need them to execute something, if they don't execute it, that's on the coach. It's not on the player. Because you're, you're at Ohio State now. You're not at... You're not at your high school. You're not middle school where maybe a kid doesn't understand it. These kids have all been hand selected by the coaching staff and you're dealing with the best players in the country here. So they, you know, if they don't get it, that's on the coach. And if they're not executing, that's on the coach. You got to coach them up. So, you know, when we blow a fake, uh, a fake punt versus Michigan at home two years ago, that's on the coach. That's not, or excuse me, last year, that's on the coach. That's not on anybody else. When we, uh, you know, can't, we screw up a fake punt against Georgia it's on the coach. You know, when we kick a field goal that we know, and again, I, I talked to people that were directly around uh, our kicker against Georgia, when they know that field goal is grossly out of his range and you still try to kick it and he has no chance of hitting it, he's never hit a field goal that long before, that's on the coach. You know, so again, you can tell me, hey, Kirk, you know, I'll take you out to that PGA course and you can go, dry, tr go try to drive that 400-yard green. Well, I'm not Roy McElroy, so it's probably not going to happen. So... But again, I could go out there and swing with all my might and you know duff it into the ground, but that's kind of what happens because when you're poorly coached, uh, it comes back to bite you in the end, and that's what happened. So again, more trust around the program is great. Uh, it's great news because, again, Ryan Day should talk to Jim Trestle at least once a week and just say, hey, because Trust is the kind of guy, he'll do anything he can to help, and he'll, and he'll donate his time. He's not a fanboy. He doesn't want anything from Ryan. And again, he's got the big ring. So at the end of the day, Ryan wants to get the big ring. This dude got the big ring, and he did it on the hardest difficulty setting possible because he did it against the Miami Hurricanes team that most people thought was the best team in history until they weren't, until the Buckeyes beat them. So, um, but that's my dissertation on special teams. Uh, Nevada, do you have anything? Uh, did, I, did I answer that in a coherent manner? Yes, and, and Caleb Downs is not leaving Ohio State. So for anybody asking if Caleb Downs is leaving Ohio State, no, Caleb Downs is not leaving why? Ohio State. Like why? Like why? Why would he leave no. to go to like, to go to Michigan to go back to Bama? Like come on, dude. Did you guys watch the national championship game? I did. I know you didn't, Nevada, because you hate Michigan. But like I watched the first like quarter, and you know Michigan already had like two hundred yards rushing in the first quarter because. That that defensive structure was so horrifically bad that Caleb Downs would look terrible in in that in that in that setup. So, you know, if, if you want to go risk your life and go play play safety when that front seven is 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 just totally not gap sound, have fun. Go do that. That'd be great. But Caleb Downs ain't going anywhere, and he's going to be a superstar this year in this uh, safety driven defense. Tony Turley, Scoopball of Famer, my man. Appreciate you so much. Thank you uh, for being a Scoopball Ultra member. Thank you for the 20. Guys, any reports yet about Jim Harbaugh violating NFL rules? Not yet, but it's still time. And he's only been there for a couple months. Uh, Nevada, uh, Jim Harbaugh, he, there's always like this little, there's always this skirting of the rules. There's always this little buzz that follows him everywhere he goes. He rubs everyone the wrong way. He'll, he'll rub the LA Chargers the wrong way. He rubbed them the wrong way during the negotiations to the part where they almost told him to go fly a kite. Um, your thoughts on that? Uh, <laughs> any reports about Jim Harbaugh violating NFL rules yet? Yeah, I mean, that's inevitable. That's that's the, that's minus 800 that that will happen. Um, yeah, he, Jim's just a strange guy that he doesn't feel like the rules apply to him. He's going to try to take advantage of anything that he possibly can. Um, he just, you know, when he gets caught, he just immediately goes to some sort of weird rant about he didn't know or it didn't matter or, or, or whatever it is. But yeah, I'm not sure what specific rule, but I would bet anything that he, that he has broken a rule yet. And um, 
you know, when the NCAA sanctions come down on Michigan, which they will come down on Michigan, I'm still believing that Goodell's going to offer something to – he's going to take something away from San Diego for hiring Harbaugh. It's, it's going to be something. It's going to be a draft pick. It's going to be a fine. It, it'll be something because, you know, when a guy gets a seven-year or ten-year show cause or whatever he's going to get in college and he's able just to run out underneath after he started the fire, burn the program down – and run to the NFL. I just don't think that's going to sit well with Goodell. So I think uh, his rule breaking and his propensity for rule breaking, even though it was in college, is going to come back to haunt him with the Chargers. And uh, we'll see if I'm right on that. Yeah, I um, I think it's going to be one of those things where you know he, I I, I see it. he like he he got in a fight with Jim Schwartz after uh, a game. I mean, he just he's just that guy. I mean, everywhere he goes, trouble follows and. I think it's going to be interesting. I mean, they just they just shipped Keenan Allen out, who's one of the best players in the history of the Chargers. They cut Mike Williams, who went to the Jets. So they got rid of their top two receivers. I mean, Keenan Allen's like almost, I don't say he's a Hall of Famer, but I mean, if he has, you know, three more years like he had this past year, he's going to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, so now poor Justin Herbert is throwing to a rookie last year who wasn't very good. Uh, and they got rid of Gerald Everett, the tight end. So, I mean, and Austin Eckler. So it's like, I, they've totally remade that offense from being, a really dynamic offense that just has such an atrociously bad head coach that I don't know. Like, like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I get getting rid of Mike Williams, but I don't know how you get rid of Keenan Allen. Now his cap number was insane. It was like, I think 30 million bucks. So, you know, Chicago ate it up because they had a bunch of cap space, but I thought it was, uh, it was interesting that he shows up and he just guts the whole wide receiver room and takes all of just, you know, Justin Herbert's going to be relegated to being JJ McCarthy, where he's going to throw the ball 20 times a game and hand it off 40 times a game. And that's going to be the, uh, the new way of doing things. Uh, another super chat. Oh, here we go, Nevada. This is a good one. Pedro's Luciario. Appreciate you. Thanks for the deuce. Trust is allowed back, but prior supposedly isn't. That is a uh, an interesting one. And I don't know if Terrell isn't allowed back or he doesn't want to come back or he doesn't feel like coming back or what the deal is. But again, there's, you know, there's a lot of guys that don't go back to the Woody Hayes. I mean, Excuse me. There's a lot of guys that felt like they were exploited by the program. They don't like the program. They don't feel like uh, so. Again, like I, you know, I don't really care if Terrell comes back. I like Terrell. Um, I think that he got did dirty, but um, it'd be interesting to see if they ever actually welcome him back because he made the school a crap ton of money and he carried our team for you know in in eight nine ten. I mean, he was basically our offense. But what are your thoughts on that, Nevada? Trust is allowed back. Obviously, trust is allowed back. Uh, but Pryor um, supposedly is not. Well, yeah, I mean, Trust broke NCAA rules, and, and he's back and is kind of a golden child. And, hey, I mean, heck, Maurice Claret, they have him talking to the team and bringing him in and MC13 for life. And and that guy single-handedly tried to burn the program down. You know, got, was responsible for Andy Geiger leaving the program, uh, just did – article after article just killing ohio state and uh we embrace him but prior is uh is, is kind of a pariah i'll never understand that i mean does it really matter no girl prior's life's fine and stuff but i i do feel like there's kind of an incomplete part of uh ohio state's history where that prior's not a big part of it because he was i mean he's probably the single biggest recruiting story that i've ever been involved in uh, since I've been you know been doing this, I've been doing this for a very long time, and uh, and he was just an, an amazing talent. And I, I think it's wrong that he's not around. Maybe maybe it's by his own feeling he doesn't want to be around. But I think they should reach out and try to write that because uh, I think Terrell he, he was a chapter in Ohio State's history, and and I think it's wrong that they forget it. Yeah, I uh, I like I said. I mean, I hope Terrell comes back. But like, like I said, there's a lot of guys that don't come back. I mean, you don't see. You don't see Troy around much. You don't see Darian Scott. You don't see, I mean, Chris Gamble didn't even come back for the 20 year national championship reunion. So uh, again, like some guys move on. Some guys think there's like, still, you know, Al Bundy and they go hang out with Woody Hayes every day and Paul Kai scored four touchdowns and some guys move on with their lives. Cause again, it's to me, like it's, it's no different than guys that don't go back to their high school football games wearing their letterman coat. Like some guys, they, like they grow up and uh, some guys don't need to be reminded that they played football at Ohio state. And it's not my thing. Got a uh, so a little bit of an update. Um, so Matt Giriani is going to coach the punts uh, again. I I knew that the structure of the thing was going to be 
something similar. Laurinaitis is throwing the kickoffs. Keenan Bailey is throwing punt return, uh, which again, punt return, the way we fair catch, I don't even know why you need a coach on punt return anymore because we fair catch 95% of the uh, the punts. And then uh, Heartline's going to do kickoff return, which again, most of the kicks go out of the end zone or we fair catch. So not a lot of excitement there. And then you know, I think the running backs coach will get involved. But like, you know, we also have Rob Keyes, who's a QC, who actually used to be um, a head coach and a co-coordinator at uh, at Finlay. So that guy's got a little bit more experience than the average QC. But I I think that, you know, when and Matt Giriani is, is coaching punt, like James Laurinaitis is going to be helping the drills. Like, that's how it works. It's not like one guy's out there and he's by himself. Like, because all of James's linebackers are going to be out there working on the punt unit. So uh, it's not going to be like, you know, a one-man band. So... I'm sure Matt Gariotti will be helping James do drills and uh, the, the guys will be helping Keenan. Like there's like a leader and then there's like the guys that are all helping run the stations and do the drills because it's, it's, it's a big, you know, if you're the, you know, if you're Tim Walton and it's a uh, punt period, you know, there's a chance that some of your corners are going to be on that. So, I mean, they're going to be over there doing it. So, you know, Tim Walton's going to be helping coach those guys up too. So it's, it's, it's a big committee. That's how it always has been. It's not like, you know, I'm sure that there's one guy who kind of has his name written on it, but, you know, those guys all help each other out. Um, and then, like, the because then the offensive line and the defensive line usually have to own their own thing, walking through stuff, doing drills, uh, whatever. Usually take a little bit of a break during special teams because, you know, usually after special teams, you go right back into team drills. So we used to, like, when I used to do it with Ed Warner, like, we kind of walk through some stuff, chill a little bit because um, we didn't want teams started. Like, teams were, you know, you, these guys got to be ready to go. So we get them. Uh, kind of hydrated and uh, we'd walk through some stuff. We, we wouldn't want to kill him and got him and make him exhausted and then have good team versus the D line. who's over there sitting on their helmets. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it was all fair. Uh, Sean Rollins. Thank you for the pay it forward. I hope Worcester is wonderful tonight. Korsha house is a great pizza place uh, in Worcester. If you've ever been, it's fantastic. And it is also uh, cash only, which I had to find out the hard way. I had to go find an ATM. I had a pizza from there. My high school coach loved Koisha House in Worcester. Uh, so thank you for being an ultra member. Thank you for the 10, paying it forward. Appreciate you as always, brother. You and uh, the other crew are all hilarious. You and uh, Dev and Akeem Torah. Um, so yeah. But it's, um, yeah, it's really good. Uh, I'm going to hit this because I just saw this. Any news on Ozzy Trapilio? I think he's staying at BC. Uh, something could change, but they retained their O-line coach, which was a big deal. And uh, I uh, I think that it's going to end up keeping him there. He's a legacy. His father passed away. Um, it's just a little tricky, but he's a really good player. I mean, I talked to some people at BC, and they said he's he, – he's in a run with Taylor Decker. Uh, and he was uh, a really, really uh, smart kid. But he's 6'8". He's long. Um, could play left or right. So we'll see. I mean, if he hits the portal, I mean, there's nowhere better to come than Ohio state. Cause, um, you know, if we locked out another tackle, right. But I think that our tackles are going to be good. We're going to be in good shape with George Fitzpatrick, Luke Montgomery, Tigra. You know, I don't think Tigra has the feet to play outside. And that's not me being a hater. I just think Tigra's body type is more for a guard. He's shorter. Um, but that's just my opinion. And if Tigra proves me wrong, I hope he does. Uh, but I think that right tackle spot if we can find a guy that can pass block and keep Josh Fryer at right guard, our offensive line is going to be dominating and probably one of the top five in the country. So, and even if we got to put Josh back out at right, uh, right tackle, then he was going to have to be all big 10 last year. And I think we'll be in good shape. Uh, any other super chats? Did we get another one? Did, did we just got one? B Schmidt. Thank you for the five. Appreciate you, my man. Oh boy. Here we go. What have you heard about the interior D line looks outside of JT Tui Malowal, Ty Leak Williams, Ty Hamilton, and Jack Sawyer? That is a great question. Uh, Nevada. I've been talking for a minute. I know you probably want to start off with hero canoe. Uh, what have you heard about the interior D line? Yeah. I mean, hero would be the, the guy that, you know, I mean, he's a guy that they're actually scheming for right now when they're talking about kind of going to that bare front uh you know they're talking about doing it with 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 hero out there and you know th that would be a ty hamilton uh hero canoe ty Lake williams look with with jack sawyer and, and uh and jt kind of the stand-up defensive ends so you know hero's a guy that you got to keep an eye on all the time i mean he's just super active in practice a guy that they love a guy that they, they want to get more playing time to so i think you know, i think he's a guy that you know, if you're talking about who's going to be my emerging star 
on the interior defensive line, he's definitely the guy that's going to get you know, first pick. And after that, I mean, you got a bunch of guys. I mean, you've got what? Kate, Kate McDonald. I want, I want to get the name right. I want to Kate McDonald. I, cause I know that they like him a lot, but I want to make sure it wasn't the, the McDougal or the, the McDougally that, that transferred. So, uh, I, I believe that's it. They, they like him a lot. I've, I've heard his name a lot from other offensive linemen. We talk the offensive. I li- always like last the offensive lineman who's tough to block, you know, who's difficult to go up against, you know, who's the guy that, that gives you the most trouble. And he's a guy that they talk about a lot. They talk about how strong he is. And, um, Edric Houston. I mean, Edric Houston, another guy that, you know, you know, I, I know they like to move him around from defensive end. They like to drop him inside. He's a guy that can play just about anywhere on the line because he's super disruptive. I mean, he's kind of an Aaron Donald type from that standpoint. You know, not saying he's Aaron Donald, not saying he's the greatest defensive lineman of all time, but he's a guy that they've been working on, not you know, having him a defensive end, dropping him to the inside where he can kind of create a matchup problem. And um, so he's another guy. That, so lots of options for Ohio State, um, but it'll, it'll be interesting to see as it kind of goes forward you know, who kind of, you know, if there's any other guys, if you know, Mensa comes up, if any of the other younger guys that kind of you know, move forward and make a move uh, in spring ball. But if we do, we'll know. Well, it's funny. We talked about a Shaman Abadada high school kid uh, a little bit ago in J.J. Smith. A guy who's been balls has been Kenyatta. Kenyatta Jackson is a guy where it's, it's go time now, baby. I mean, he's a junior. Uh, no more waiting around. And he's a guy that's uh, – been explosive. I don't think that there's any question that you know Edric Houston showing up probably a little bit, little little bit more of a spark behind him. Uh, him and Cade have been really good this spring, I and mean, I think that that's something that bears watching because again, I I've lamented the fact that we had to play our two defensive ends for the entire Notre Dame game last year. That's the most insane thing I've ever seen in my entire life. But we did it, uh, and it was crazy. And I um you know, I hated it, and those guys really didn't deserve to. Uh, to be put out there like that. But, um, you know, it kind of is what it is, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with that, I, uh, I think we need Kenyatta to step up in a big way. And I think Edric needs to play too. I think you gotta, you gotta rotate these guys in and, uh, keep Jack and JT fresh because I keep saying the season is getting longer and longer. And I felt like our guys, our our rotation was trash last year. And, and and part of it is it's not always Larry Johnson's fault, but these guys got to prove that they can play. You know, I mean, two years ago, it was Larry Johnson's fault when he wasn't playing Ty Leak and he wasn't playing Mike Hall and he's playing Jerron Cage. And he's playing Teron Vincent and two non NFL players. Then, you know, Mike Hall could end up being a first round pick, a late first rounder because of how well he tested um, at, at least a second rounder, I think. Uh, and Ty Leak will end up being a late first uh, or second round pick if he balls out and is hungry again this year. But I, uh, I don't know. I think it's going to be fascinating to watch because this seems like a very deep defensive line. Uh, if you can get Hero revved up and play the way that he was when he was a recruit, uh, I think you better look out because Hero's uh, he's an explosive dude for a big big body dude. He's explosive, and I think he's going to be really exciting to watch. Well, Nevada, the uh, basketball game is about to tip off, uh, so let's uh, wrap this thing up. Uh, any final thoughts for tonight? Now, um, just if you like money, we've been promoting Dagestan Poppy, uh, P A P I, Twitter. Uh, for some MA picks, if you like MMA, there's a big MA, not a huge MMA card, but but a card you can make some money on. One of the cards we feel maybe the best we have of the entire year. So if you get a chance to check them out, check out Dagestan Poppy on Twitter. He's got all his picks all loaded up for free. So you don't have, you, it, it, you don't have to pay anything. You get them for free. And if you like uh, if you like money and you like betting, you might want to consider tailing some of his action because he's been on a red red. He's been as, as hot as Julian saying has been at Ohio State practice. That's how hot he's been. And uh, that's all I got to say. And uh, this is that's his uh, Twitter, Dagestan Poppy, D-A-G-E-S-T-A-N, Dagestan, which is obviously where Khabib is from, uh, one of the greatest fighters to ever live. Poppy, uh, just because he likes to be called Poppy, I guess, I don't know. But this is the card. These are the picks. Uh, you can check his action at betmma.tips slash Grayson S., and he has been absolutely killing the game recently. So there you go. Enjoy your UFC card tonight. As always, we appreciate you guys uh, leading right into the basketball game. Thank you so much for kicking with us. I hope you guys are having a great Saturday. If you guys enjoy this content, please leave us a like. Click subscribe. Also click that little alert bell. Those are all huge for growing this channel. Uh, again, thank you for all that you guys do. Shout out where you guys are watching from. 
Shout out who you guys are watching with. And we also thank you guys so very much for being a part of our network and everything we do. This is another huge episode because you guys made it one. And we thank you. Uh, when there's a lot of stuff going on with March Madness, Ohio State, uh, multiple sports, uh, Ohio State-wise, uh, ba baseball, basketball, women's basketball. Uh, it's crazy right now. But we appreciate you guys uh, finding time to watch us. So I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Buckeye Nation. And thank you, Scoop family. I'm going to talk to you guys tomorrow. Uh, probably seven o'clock. Uh, we'll let you know if it's any earlier. Hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Go Bucks. And I'm doing this just for you, Devin. Uh, I came back, which I normally don't do. Uh, Ohio 775, a.k.a. Devin, a.k.a. Uh, the Keeper of the Cujo. Thank you for being a Scoop Ultra member, and thank you uh, for being the Wrench Man. Appreciate you, brother. Um, what up, fellas and family in the chat? Is Seth good enough to play somewhere on our line, or will he leave? 24, 25, Natty Lock. Nevada, OH. He's gone, so I'll say IO. I, um, I think he's good enough to play right guard, um, but he's going to be battling with Carson. He can start at center, too. I mean, that, that battle is far from over, um, but he's got to pick it up a little bit, and I think Carson is hungry and... They got an edge, and that'll be a ferocious competition, and I'm really excited about it. So uh, it'll be all good family. So that's a great question, uh, Devin. Um, and he's got to play somewhere. And if not, we'll have quality depth. So it'll be exciting to see uh, what we can get out of him because I think uh, him and he's inspired Carson to turn up a lot, and Carson's playing really well right now. Uh, so as always, appreciate you guys. Uh, thank you so much, Buckeye Nation, and thank you, Scoop Family. Take two. Hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Go Bucks.